Well, my last sermonette earlier this month was actually part one of two. And uh, that message, you may recall, was titled Supplies, Part One, Staff and Sandals Are Not. And I'll just catch up a little bit, especially for those who weren't here then. Welcome, certainly, to our guests. Happy to have you today. Um, I had originally wanted to cover something in Luke 22, so go ahead and turn over there, please. But uh, I realized that I needed to clear up what some have pointed to as a um, contradiction in the Bible. And it's actually not, but it can be a bit confusing. You know, we see here in Luke 22, Luke 22 and verse 35, that uh, Jesus said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? Now, this was that night he was betrayed and was going to be uh, taken uh, before his death the next morning. Um, well, actually, he died the next afternoon. He was crucified the next morning. Uh, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. Now, it's in looking back at the previous accounts uh, where he told them this that we encountered the apparent contradiction. We compared these passages about when Jesus sent out the twelve, and that's in uh, Matthew 10 and Mark 6 and Luke 9. And we also noted him sending out the 70 with similar instructions in Luke 10. But here in Luke 22, it says they went without sandals. Uh, yet in Mark, it says they were to wear sandals. And there was also the issue or not. We covered that. What we learned is that when he had sent them out before, they were basically not to take anything extra beyond what they already had. They were not to get a staff if they didn't already have one. They were not to take bread nor a money bag, nor gold, silver, or copper in their money belt. They were not to take extra sandals or an extra tunic or knapsack. Basically, they were not to pack. <laughs> they were to be unencumbered and just go as they were. But now Jesus says it's going to be different. Look in, uh, here in Luke 22, verses 36 through 38. Then he said to them, But now, he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Well, this is what I want us to look at today. Brethren, why was Jesus telling them to have swords? Was it to fulfill the prophecy about him being numbered with the transgressors? And I've titled this Supplies Part 2. Swords to fulfill prophecy? Swords to fulfill prophecy? Now, there's been this idea that many have had that Jesus would never have told them to get swords except to get them falsely accused of being criminals so as to fulfill this prophecy about Jesus being numbered with the transgressors. Uh, you know, the prophecy comes from Christ as the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. We often read that at Passover. Isaiah 53, 12 says he would be numbered with the transgressors. Now, maybe you've heard it explained this way before. But there are major problems with that. I'll point out five aspects of interpreting this passage. The first, part, first of these fairly quickly. Five aspects of interpreting this passage. Number one, swords were not an issue in Christ's trials. Swords were not an issue in Christ's trials. Nothing later or in any of the gospel accounts says that the disciples having swords contributed to Jesus being found guilty of being a criminal or insurrectionist. His claims to be the Messiah and thus a king are what brought that about. We do have the whole episode of Peter drawing the sword and striking off the officer's ear uh, that night, which Jesus healed after telling Peter to put the sword away. Peter ran into the night. None of that came up later in any of the trials, at least, you know, what's recorded. 
Now you'd think if Jesus was trying to stage some accusation with a sword, that he would have pulled out a sword himself. As the prophecy says, he would be numbered with the transgressors. Yet he put a stop to Peter's actions. Number two, Jesus would not promote deception. Jesus would not promote deception. So that's another issue. Why would Jesus stage something to make him and his disciples falsely appear guilty? Jesus came as the truth and to bear witness of the truth. It makes no sense that he would basically practice deception in this, telling his disciples to arm themselves so that people would think they were outlaws when they weren't. This just doesn't make sense. Number three, the prophecy was fulfilled in Christ's crucifixion with criminals. The prophecy was fulfilled in Christ's crucifixion with the criminals. Actually, we're specifically told how Jesus fulfilled being numbered with the transgressors in Mark 15. I won't have you turn there, but Mark 15, 25 through 28. It says there that he was crucified with the accusation nailed above him, the king of the Jews, and with him they crucified two robbers on each side of him. And next in the majority text it says, So the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with the transgressors. So he was in his punishment counted as a sinner and criminal along with the others. Okay. If Jesus was not telling his disciples to get swords to activate the prophecy, what was he saying? That brings us to number four. Buying a sword was obviously meant for later. Buying a sword was obviously meant for later. Note that he said here in Luke twenty-two thirty-six. 36, we just read this, verse 36, that if they did not have a sword to sell their garment... That means their extra garment. It doesn't mean that they're to sell what they're wearing and go naked. So if they have other garments, they're going to sell that and buy a sword. To actually go buy one, he says. This is not talking about that very Passover night when he would soon be arrested. Were they supposed to go bartering or buying and selling that night? No, Jesus clearly meant beyond that time, going forward. This is something for later. That's why when the disciples responded that they had a couple swords, Jesus said that was enough. He apparently just meant, okay, that's fine for now. But again, his instruction was really clearly for later. But why? It goes with the whole context of what he was saying here. And that's number five, which is the main issue here. Number five, we must consider the context of changed, changed instructions for changed circumstances. The context of changed instructions for changed circumstances. The context here is all too often ignored in explaining this. But, and this is vital, context matters. Context matters. Jesus is saying, when I sent you out before, you didn't need to take anything. They didn't need to take money or food or extra clothes. Why not? Because they would be provided for by the people that they preach to. We can see this in other passages we looked at in part before. I want you to hold your place here in Luke 22 and turn over to Matthew 10. Luke 22, and let's look at Matthew 10. In Matthew 10... We read verses uh, 9 through 11. Matthew 10, verses 9 through 11. When he sent the 12 out, he said, Provide neither gold nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Notice that. And then he says, Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there until you go out. Uh, we get a little bit more clarification over in Luke chapter 10 when he sent out the 70. Let's look at that. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. This is where, you know, he sent in Luke 9, he sent out the 12. 
uh, and in Luke 10, he sends out the 70. It's a very similar uh, instruction. He says in verse 4, read ver verses 4 through 8. In verse 4, carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. Uh, that was these long, elaborate greetings uh, they had back then and, and, and sitting down. And the, basically, they were on the Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, somebody is re responding well, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Uh, you're going to be taken care of. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. So they're going to go around, they're going to be preaching. And they're going to be provided for by the people they're preaching to. That's why he says here when he says the laborer is worthy of his wages. They're going to, you know, back then, uh, rabbis were actually uh, given money and, and given assistance to, by people to whom they were preaching. That was kind of a common thing. Paul talks about this when he says for the ministry uh, to receive the offerings. He's, he compared it to uh, the Old Testament command about don't muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. In other words, while it's doing its work in the field, it's also to be able to eat of that. And so the same was true for those preaching. They were to be provided for by those they were preaching to. And they're going to eat. They're going to they're going to be given things. They're going to be fed. They're going to be clothed. They're going to be sheltered by the people that they were preaching to. That's why they didn't need to take anything and they need to be on the go. So go back to your place in Luke 22 there, when I had you hold your place here, back to Luke 22. Okay, now things were going to be different. Jesus is telling them that they needed to take steps to prepare. In verse 36 here, he says to have money and a knapsack ready. A bug out bag, <laughs> Mr. Barnett has said to me before, and that's true, a bug out bag essentially and to obtain a sword if they didn't already have one. Now, this was all normal stuff back then for traveling on the road, especially in dangerous conditions. All things would be more dangerous now. Why? Verse 37, he said, For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. What is the point here? Jesus was about to be condemned as a criminal insurrectionist. His followers would then be considered fellow outlaws. In fact, we know that they would soon be persecuted and even hunted. And Jesus is saying that they needed to be prepared and to be on the move. But it's not like before. Before, they could go without provisions. People, wherever they went, were taking care of their needs. But now, people would be less likely to do so, fearing the authorities or believing Jesus had been a false prophet after all, and he died for it. And those who were still receptive, you know, there would be people that still believed, but staying at their homes too long could put those people in danger. And as they were on the run, they might not always be able to go the safest ways or rely on civil authorities to aid them. After what was coming that night and the next day, things would be a lot more perilous going forward. What all this means is that Jesus was not telling them to get a sword to activate the prophecy of him being counted as a transgressor, he is telling them to get a sword and be on the ready because the prophecy would be activated. The sword and other gear here were not what would get Jesus labeled a criminal. They were needed because Jesus would be labeled a criminal. But why a sword among this gear? That's a touchy subject, of course. We might ask another question. Why did the disciples already have a couple swords among them? These were theirs. They didn't find them in the room and claim them, which would have been stealing. In any case, I doubt these were for chopping wood or cutting grass. The typical reason for swords on the road was protection against robbers, usually, but also against wild animals. 
I'm not going to speculate here, but I do think it's worth noting that they already had a couple and that Jesus was telling them to be further prepared for taking, you know, the situation in hand. They would be separated at times and sometimes on the run. It was not a general statement for all times, but for their particular circumstances to be prepared. Dangerous times were coming. Again, context matters. To conclude then, brethren, the swords were not to fulfill prophecy, but because the prophecy would be fulfilled. My final thought here is a caution not to be bringing preconceived notions into interpreting Scripture, but to let the Bible interpret the Bible, especially in the sense of carefully considering the context of any statement in question, because context matters. That is a vital key to understanding what the Bible is actually telling us.